<laughs> I'm see if I can use my chef to this recipe. Just, um, just to let everyone know where the toilets are, and that we have this roving mic, and if there's a deep call in your heart, please do raise your hands, and we'll slowly come around to you. So just really, if there's a deep call in your heart, Dave's going to sort of flow right through, but then um, he's also open to questions. He'll abide that one. It's fine. It's a very long cord. So we have the toilets. Are turned right on your way up, and there's a staircase, and you'll loop around, and they're just pretty much right underneath this space, right here where Donna's out there, downstairs. And I will be doing the roving mic as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Oh, it's just a pleasure, a joy to be here, and uh, I have been, I think, to Boulder before, but I have not uh, done a public gathering, so it's always fun for me to come to a place, and Boulder's just warm in my heart, so I'm really grateful to come and share. I feel, too, that my life is is one of, of deep devotion to spirit and following spirit, and so that's really the aim of we could say spiritual practice is to be in the flow of presence and to be in that, you might say, listen, follow, just to be tuned in uh, to spirit. And uh, in my life, I used A Course in Miracles, uh, I think it's been about, it's about 30 years now uh, that the Course has come into my life. And there's a, a line from A Course in Miracles that says, when you have learned to decide with God, all decisions become as easy 
and as right as breathing. And it will be as if you are carried down a quiet path in summer. So here we are, we're gathering here at this beautiful center in Columbine Center and we're here to experience the ease of decision making. Because in this world there are times when decision making can seem to be quite complex. Where we come to points where it seems to be difficult to make a decision. And yet, I would say that the Spirit is always with us, helping us unwind from a faulty perception of the world, a distorted perception of fragmentation and coming into just the intuitive flow of our heart. And just being able to ride that like, like a feather on the breeze, just floating and floating and floating. And that really is the destiny for your life, is to be in presence and to just float on the breeze. And to come to a place where there are no difficult decisions where the Spirit is so guiding you, the Spirit is so out in front of you that you don't have any hesitation or doubt, but just a sense of relaxation and ease. So for me, that's what I say the parable of David is about because um, even though it's been about three decades since the Course dropped into my path, I would say that my immersion with the Course was so quick and so strong that I'd say after about two and a half or three years the signs and symbols started to be all around me and then I made contact with the, my internal teacher which was Jesus and, and basically it wasn't just kind of a, a feeling at that point uh, it, was, it was a stream of thoughts that gave me very explicit instructions. Where to go, what to do, who to see, what to drop, what to let go of. Uh, it was extremely specific and so that's part of this ease that I'm going to talk about tonight is making contact and when you have that contact and it becomes consistent, that's where the ease comes into your life. While there's still an ego part in your mind is still trying to run the show, or maybe just partly run the show. Like, God, I'll give you this, 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 but I'm in charge of this, that, that. Then that's where the struggle comes in. It's only difficult when we try to run some aspects of our life that the struggle comes in. If we were able to, as they say, let go and let God completely, then the struggle is gone. What does that mean? It means it's happiness, it's joy, it's freedom. But it's a state of mind. There's a part in A Course in Miracles where Jesus says, what do you want? Freedom of the body or freedom of the mind? For both you cannot have. So one's a trick and one's the reality of things. And so some of you may have even seen The Matrix when uh, Morpheus puts Neo through some tests and, and at one point Morpheus just says, I'm trying to free your mind. It's basically what he tells Neo before he jumps across from one skyscraper to the next on the roof. The same message that Jesus is sharing in the Course is you can have a free mind. We've had hints of that. You know, we, we know of people throughout history. Uh, everyone knows the story of Gandhi. Gandhi was locked up in prison for quite a lot. A, a large part of his life was spent in prison, in jail, and yet he came to such peace and such freedom, happily doing his journaling and writing newsletters, exchanging vegetarian <laughs> recipes inside the prison. You know, he came to a, a freedom within and then extended that in his teaching, in his demonstration, in his witness for everyone. And Mandela is another good example. Quite a lot of time his body was imprisoned, but in the end he knew as he was walking out of the prison that if he didn't drop the hatred when he walked out of that prison, then he would still be in prison. He had that strong thought when he was being released. 
I don't drop the hatred, I'm still in prison. So we have a, a sense of that, that this, it's consciousness where the imprisonment occurs. And really, through this inner guidance, through this intuition, higher self, higher power, whatever you want to call it, that's going to be the road to freedom. Now, a lot of the traditions in the East, in India, they talk about the world as, as like a play, a lila. And uh, there are traditions in the East that talk about the world as maya. And maya would be illusion. It would be the relative world that is taken for granted by the five senses as being real. And in The Course in Miracles, Jesus does use the word illusion. Basically, the entire Course in Miracles could be summarized with the part at the very beginning, at the conclusion of the introduction, nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists, herein lies the peace of God. What is the real but the everlasting, but the infinite, but the eternal, but the changeless? That's what the real is. It's, it's what we sometimes refer to as, as light. Not light like sunlight or fluorescent light or the lights we're, we're familiar with in this world, but just the light of wisdom, the light of understanding, the light of peace. That abstract light cannot be threatened because it is, as Byron Katie might say, it is what is. What is is just pure love, light, oneness, abstract oneness. And even our scientists have been formulating and pondering about this universe, they, they're pretty sure there was some kind of a big bang. And what fascinates them most is what is prior to the big bang. <laughs> What's before the big bang? Even though I think the way shower from 2000 years ago, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He's pretty much saying that the I amness, the reality that we call love and light is prior to the big bang. And therefore, it's prior to time. So the present moment that all the saints and sages talk about is actually prior to time. And there have been scientists now that have, uh, like Brian Greene comes to mind as a physicist who's literally mapped out the entire cosmos. And he says, it looks like a loaf of bread. Is what <laughs> it looks like a static loaf of bread. It's already happened, so it's just kind of like where you seem to be in that loaf of bread is basically your perspective on the whole cosmos. Whatever coordinates that you call your self, your flesh self, your human self with the five senses, that's like a little point in the loaf of bread that's looking out at the loaf of bread and the stars and the planets and everything from inside that loaf of bread. And basically, he said the bread is already there, it's already happened. And there are a lot of traditions that talk about destiny and so on and so forth and the script and so basically that really contradicts our human perception that that the whole cosmos is like a loaf of bread and that we're looking inside of a loaf of bread. It seems to be more exciting <laughs> than that. Another concept that you can bring in from science is, is entropy, basically Ever since the Big Bang, everything that seems to be moving within the cosmos uh, is basically moving towards destruction. It's, it's falling apart. Um, and there's all kinds of examples, but if you watch the cycles of nature, or if you simply take a, a cube of ice out from your freezer, and you set it out on your patio, and you just watch it. It loses its shape, and it goes into liquid. It goes from something that seems to be structured and ordered, and it has pretty solid dimensions to something that's just liquid, and it just rolls out and rolls away, or evaporates. Basically, that's the concept of entropy. So. Oftentimes we try to romanticize this world and we try to romanticize parts of the world, but basically the scientists are saying, no, it's all entropy, it's all moving towards chaos. You can deny it, but this is the fact of it. And they will say that once you go back to the Big Bang, that it actually, the cosmos becomes very ordered when you come back closer and closer to 
the Big Bang and prior to the Big Bang. So we're back to that. Even the scientists are saying that whatever came before the Big Bang, there was order. We might call that nirvana. We might call that the kingdom of heaven. We could call it I amness. It's perfect unified oneness. And now even the quantum physicists that study the, the subatomic particles and they go deeper, deeper, where they just come down to basically connected energy. They call it entanglement. Everything is connected. There they are. They've come up with another word. The poets have words for it. The scientists have words for it. Those in religion have words for it. And those that have spirituality have words for it. It's all the same thing. It's perfect connectedness. Recently I was, I was looking a little bit at the life of Einstein and Einstein early on in his early career discovered this thing which he called quantum light and, and yet he never could understand what quantum light was. He spent his whole lifetime hoping that he would come to a greater appreciation of understanding of that and then I think he died around 1955 still not understanding what quantum light was. There was another concept in quantum physics, entanglement, where everything seemed to be completely connected regardless of time and space. And basically, to Einstein, there was something a little, a little fearful, I think, around that connectedness because, what was it, uh, Jeffrey's spooky action at a distance. <laughs> That's what Einstein called it. You know, you could do something to one particle and then many, many thousands of miles away there could be the same thing happening to another part. Spooky action at a distance. Well, it's only spooky, I would say, if you believe in particles. <laughs> That's where it gets spooky. Because there's a thing called the whole and then there's parts. And as long as we believe in the parts, we're afraid of the whole. It's, the whole is spooky. You know how they say the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Well, the whole is real and the parts are not. That's why it's so spooky. And that's why we have fears being identified with a, a human being, being identified with the flesh. The Course is taking us in another direction. It's saying one of the lessons is I am not a body, I am free, I am still as God created me. Taking us into that divine presence, that divine order that was created by God, where all of our thoughts are thoughts that we think with God, and all of the ego is just nothing more than the attempt to think apart from God, or think against God. So that's why we're opening to learn forgiveness. We're not here to forgive the truth. The truth is just what is. It's, it's forgiving what the ego made. It's forgiving this puff of nothingness. It's forgiving this, this resistance, this reaction to God, this death wish. We have to learn to forgive it in our minds. And as long as we are invested in the world of form, as long as we are invested in the parts and the particles and, and all of that fragmented perception, then forgiveness escapes us. You might say that you have to see the world in a unified way before it disappears from your awareness and you realize that you are only love and light. That unified perception is what forgiveness is. So when we talk about forgiving people even, which is what human beings often do, forgiving people, and the Bible says you have to forgive 70 times 7, and some of us have tried that. That's 490 times and it doesn't work. It, it's, we say, what's going on? If I've done something wrong, I followed the instructions. Uh, I followed the formula there and it's still there. It means that we have to be so immersed in purpose, so guided by spirit, that our entire perception of the world fuses together. So we're coming back to a fusion of perception. Now, perception is just a witness, it's not a fact. And I had students back in the 1990s that used to, they would read the Course and then they would, they would have a sentence and they would say, stop everything. Jesus is saying in the Course, no one can be angry at a fact. Now, tell me what a fact is before we go any further. And I would say, God is a fact. 
Christ is a fact, and no one can be angry at a fact. But there's nothing perceptual that is a fact. It's very ephemeral. It's very temporary. It's always shifting and changing, moving, moving, moving. There's nothing stable about perception until we have a unified purpose that stabilizes all the events, that brings our mind to a sense of detachment from form outcomes, detachment from expectations, even detachment from goals and ambitions that used to be important. It doesn't matter when you seem to come to this unified perception, it could be on your deathbed. You may simply be having an experience of dying or, as they say in unity, making your transition, but you have an instant where you realize everything is unified and you simply rise up in that perception, welcoming the truth, welcoming that oneness. Doesn't matter what the form is, there's no particular time except for now that that can be realized. So, I like to talk about this in many, many, many different ways. Sometimes I will just sing. Sometimes I will use movies as parables in, in a way of expressing the pathway to this oneness. I call movies the modern day parables. And I've been using movies for so many years now that, that this book came through me and a website. It's basically the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. It's very unconventional. Some people think of meditation, prayer, rituals, movies. How did I miss that one? <laughs> Get the popcorn out. I'm ready for, for an exciting journey using these movies. And it can come through explanations through science. Now our quantum physics are getting to be quite spectacular. Welcome. Come on in. We have people still, still coming. And, and I feel like it's helpful to have a lot of tools, so to speak, a lot of vocabulary in our, in our toolbox, so to speak, to be able to relate this and express this in a way that is truly helpful. That's the one thing I've learned about traveling around and around the world and all the people that I meet is my life is so given over that I haven't a clue what is coming out of my mouth or what I will say or do. And that cluelessness has been really helpful for me to have harmonious relationships. Because when you're out and about, you just never know uh, what people are going to say. I was, I was on a plane one time in Australia and, and the man next to me did not speak a word to me through the whole flight, but as the flight was descending down towards the runway, he turned and he looked at me, he said, you know, time is a crazy thing. That was the first words that he spoke. Not even hi. He just said, time is a crazy thing. I said, tell me about it. And he went on to explain how he had a cell phone plan that was in two different territories. And so when he was in, on his back porch, he got charged an astronomical phone bill because <laughs> he was in a different territory when he was in his back porch than when he was in his living room making a call. And he just voluntarily said that to me. Time is, is a funny thing, it's a crazy thing. And he was expressing what I've come to understand, that, that time is very funny. Because uh, I fly around so much, I go through so many time zones, and you can see how actually time, it seems like we're always dealing with time, like we're human beings in time, but actually Einstein discovered that time is, is relative. It's not an absolute. That was always fascinating to me that, that common sense would tell us that one second in Uganda is the same as one second in Russia, is the same as one second in America, is the same as one second in France. It seems like no matter what the clocks look like, it's, a tick is still a tick. You must remember this. <laughs> a tick is still a tick. <laughs> a sigh is just a sigh. 
the fundamental things apply as time goes by. It seems like one second is one second, no matter what language, what culture, or what country. But Einstein discovered that no, time was connected to space in kind of a, a proportional relationship. And so, just like we, if we moved a camera around this, this room, we would get all these different perspectives. Time is as relative as everything else. And it, it's because of motion. It, it, it involves gravity. Uh, basically, the way they found that out on this planet was they, they took these atomic clocks that were extremely, extremely accurate, and they had one on the ground, and they took one in a, in a jet plane that flew around. And the one, when the plane landed, they put the two clocks together, and they weren't telling the same time. The one that was up flying around in motion had different time than the one that was on the ground. So motion and space are interacting in ways and uh, you know, black holes, there's the gravity is much, much stronger in black holes which has an enormous effect on time. If you went and lived in a black hole for a while you <laughs> and you came back to Earth, it would be shocking, uh, the d time difference, you know. Where's my dog? You know, it's like everything would be completely different. So we're learning that time and space are relative. And Jesus even addresses this in A Course in Miracles. He says, time and space are two different forms of the same error. <laughs> oh, it's great to hear the Master talking about that. And yet we seem to be in time and space just like a fish lives in water. It seems such a constant. It's like something that we talk about in such an accepted way. It's such a, an assumed thing. As, as well as the body. The body seems to be this thing that's, that's very s stable in our perception. We refer to our self in bodily terms. And in A Course in Miracles, Jesus makes a stark distinction between the body and the mind, or the body and the spirit. He basically says that what we call the body is he calls the hero of the dream. In all the serial adventures, the body is the hero of the dream. No, it's not just John Wayne. It's not just our movie characters and our, our heroes, but it's like in, in everyone's dream, the body has taken the central figure of the hero. And everything seems to be so important in relationship to the body and to time and space. So when we do spiritual practices, whether it's meditation or all different types of forgiveness, what you're actually doing is you're loosening your mind from those time-space coordinates. You're loosening your perception from that body identity. You're loosening your awareness from the particulars of time and space. And you're opening up to an, an expansive experience, which many have called mystical experiences. Some have them through drug, drug experiences. There are all different ways that people experience these expansive experiences. But what they do is they give you a glimpse that you are not what you think you are. You are so, so much more than what you have believed yourself to be. And those actions that we have in mind of the ones that were good things and bad things, those who treated us right and those who treated us wrong, those memories we have, all those memories of the body, part of the serial adventure of the body, are all part of fragmented perception that the ego has made up to keep our mind feeling guilty. That the only way we can be free and know our divine innocence, our divine truth and love and light, is to completely be rinsed and washed free of all those memory fragments. Both the good and the bad. Everything that we've perceived as our self with regard to time and space is part of the veil that covers our awareness of our oneness. So for me, when I first started to get the sense of all this, I thought, wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a, those are some big shoes. Forgive the universe. Hmm. Whoa. 
is it is there any other choice? Is there any other option there? You know, it's like. And I thought graduate school was tough. Uh, but actually what it is, is, is as we go for that, as we open our mind to that, we become more and more intuitively guided, and I'd say the spiritual journey becomes fun. It doesn't seem fun to the ego when all those dark debris are coming up from the unconscious mind. It doesn't seem fun to the ego when you're doing your shadow work, when you're exposing the, the darkness and bringing it to the light when you're raising your awareness up, it, it can seem extremely intense. It can seem very, very dark. And for many who have opened up to this path, they will, it's so daunting that they go, ah, I'm just going to be a human. I mean, it's just, it was better before I took the lid off. I had a pretty good life when the lid was still on. But when I pull the lid off, it's kind of like pop goes the weasel. I mean, it's the the shadow comes up. And Jesus does tell us that the more you look at fear, the less you will see of it. Meaning the more that you raise the fear to the light and you look open-eyed at your fears, they're fully brought up you can look at them, the less you will see of it reflected in the world. You will start to see more and more and more reflections of that love and light that you truly are. That's wonderful. That's important to know that there will be these reflections of light coming into your awareness because we need those. We need to know that we're making progress. We need to know that we're making a movement back to that light. We need, we need to be convinced, and those reflections of love and light are amazing. That's kind of, you could say, how it went in the parable of David, from David, the childhood David, pretty shy, shy through junior high, high school, shy, 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 all the way into graduate school. <laughs> very, very, very shy. And then what has happened through this transformation is now I find myself going all over the world talk, talk, talking. <laughs> Very unlike the shy persona that was more like the wallflower that just wanted to hide and blend in and not interact. It just wanted to avoid the world. It's been going out and meeting my friends, meeting beloveds everywhere around the world and feeling my heart just opening wider and wider and wider. It's Amma, the hugging saint. You know, imagine how much fun she has going around and just hugging people. That's what I'm experiencing as I go to these 40-some countries. Lots and lots of hugs. Lots of joy. Lots of laughter. And it, it comes from just being willing to listen and follow, to flow with it. Now, there are stepping stones along the way. Once you have a hint that your mind is powerful, that your consciousness is, is very powerful, then you can have experiences of what you could call manifesting, where you start to see your thoughts manifest before your eyes. And that's a very helpful step because that's showing you the power of your mind. Anything that shows you the power of your mind and the power of thought is a helpful step on the journey. And so I've had a lot of those kind of experiences myself and very many mystical experiences, very strong, very convincing. But also they always came with, with this feeling like I'm showing you this, I'm, I'm using this to show you something and the something was the power of the mind. And then it seemed to reach a point in consciousness and awareness where it was like, but, even if you could manifest anything that you think you want, wouldn't you rather have an experience of eternal happiness? Wouldn't you trade all that manifesting for a consistent state of peace? Wouldn't you go that extra step to know your source, to know your creator, to know yourself, your true identity, 
that's literally beyond even the manifesting, beyond the stage of manifesting. And for me, it was a big yes. It was like a huge yes, like yes, I want to be consistently happy, joyful. I want peace of mind. I want to have a state that transcends all judgments, all comparisons, all illness, every doubt. I want to, to live in a state of certainty. That is more important to me than even manifesting what I believe I want. Because I had to come to the realization that I didn't really know what I wanted. <laughs> You know, and, and that that I that was trying to manifest was still spinning its wheels. And having a lot of fun actually spinning its wheels. But there was something beyond that. There was something more. And to me that's what spiritual awakening is all about. Where you get to that point where you say, yes, I'm willing to know who I am. I'm willing to wake up from this dream. And I'm willing to accept the happy dream of non-judgment. Now what is a happy dream of non-judgment? Well, it's simply a state of mind where you do not have an opinion about anything. Absolutely anything. It doesn't matter what people, it's political, it can be about nature, it can be about music, it can be about movies. It's coming to a place where you don't have an opinion. You don't take a side. Now why is it important not to take a side? It's because the ego made up the dualistic system of sides. The ego invented all this variety and multiplicity and sides and when we take a side we reinforce the ego in our awareness and not love. Jesus tells us in The Course in Miracles that love makes no comparison. He says, comparison must be an ego device, for love makes none. That love is a state of perfect acceptance. It's a state of what is. It's a state that goes beyond the dualistic good and bad, right and wrong, ethics, morality. All of those still would fit in the category of judgments. And in order to forgive, we have to begin to see that we can transcend even morality, even those stepping stones that helped us along the way. There are certain things that resonate with us, no doubt, as we move through this time and space experience. And I would say those things that deeply resonate in our heart, those are our guidances. Those are our intuitive guidances, our higher self drawing us back up into our divinity. That's why it's important to be intuitive. I would say you could actually learn to live your life in being 100% intuitive. 100%. People would say, well, you know, you have to be a little grounded, you have to have a little bit of yin with a little yang, and you know, you've got to throw a few things in. I don't have, have not found that to be the case. I've found is I just keep being intuitive and intuitive. It's like I soar higher and higher and higher in awareness through following that intuition, that small still voice that's within all of us, that never contradicts itself, that always is gentle, that's always kind, that's always gracious, that's always loving. And then this raspy, critical voice in our minds that never has anything good to say about us, just res, 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 just always on us, always finding what we've done wrong, never nurturing us, always criticizing, that this intuitive guidance is helping us rise above the critic, rise above the judgment. That's what makes it fun as you go higher and higher into awareness. You simply transcend. You, you don't focus your mind on the critic anymore and you focus your mind on that intuitive voice. You want it to shine through you, to extend through you. You want to teach only love, for that is what you are. It's what the Course teaches. Everything to be a representation of that love. And as you do sink deeper into this presence, you start to realize that you become very, very content. In Buddhism, and a lot of traditions, 
contentment is, is a tremendous attribute. When you become content, you do not have expectations. You are not striving. You are not pushing. You are not trying to figure out. It's like you just lean back in your mind, back to that state of perfect contentment. Let all things be exactly as they are. All things work together for good, except in the ego's judgment. You know, the, you cannot but be in the right place at the right time. Oh, thank you. That means I'll never be late again. That's right. Oh, thank you. I had so much guilt about being late. I'm glad to know I won't be. And the Spirit says, and you'll never be early either. <laughs> You just have that contentment where you just see all things working together for good. It's a cosmic dance. You're enjoying the cosmic dance. That's a very highly trained state of mind. But isn't it worth it? And you just feel, even sentimentally, how wonderful that state of mind is to see the world as a dance. Because as soon as we look through the filter of judgment, we are back in the grips of fear. We're back in the grips of guilt. Now we want to keep this real practical because I know some of you probably have had on your mind some of the events uh, from Orlando and what's been described as the largest mass shooting in American history. And I had students who would watch the news, as many people watch the news, they see it on the internet now, it, it's hard to miss it because it's the news outlets just, it's all over, it's, it's everywhere around you. And beyond just the news, people would tell me at times, you know, well, I'd say, what, have you seen this movie, that movie? Well, I, I can't watch that movie because it's a violent movie. You might say that violence in society, violence on the news, violence on movies, uh, you, we have different religions that are calling us to a life of peace and harmony, and yet, what do you do with the question of violence? And what I say to them is the ego belief system, any belief system that opposes oneness, opposes love, opposes God, the ego belief system is what is violent. And actually, if you want to go even simpler than that, you could say that judgment is violent. And that's why Jesus gave us a Sermon on the Mount, and I think probably the two most helpful words in all of history, out of the trillions and trillions of words, were judge not. Or if you want a few more, judge not lest you be judged. If you hold on to judgment in consciousness, you cannot escape from experiencing that judgment in consciousness and in the world that you perceive. So what A Course in Miracles is really doing is it's basically saying the only way you will experience true peace is to come to peace in your heart, peace in your mind, and come to a peaceful perception of the world. You might remember in the the Bible in Corinthians, it's you're looking through a darkened glass. Well, this egoic perception of fragmentation is violent, it's a darkened glass, and though we may see some things that we call pockets of goodness, our pockets of goodness in distorted perception are always broken into by violent, violent perceptions. You may be gliding along gliding along in, in a seeming peace and harmony, but when you feel your mind is shaken to the core, you find yourself hurting, mourning, sad, angry, disturbed, irritated, then that's just meaning the ego is still in play. It's still in play in your consciousness. So the purpose of A Course in Miracles is to try to convince your mind that out of all the problems of this world, which seem to appear on many different scales, in many different degrees, and in many different situations and directions, out of all those problems that you believe you have, the first thing that A Course in Miracles will do 
is help you come to the understanding and the recognition that you have a perceptual problem. Not a relationship problem, not a financial problem, not a problem with gunmen, not a problem with terrorists, not a problem with the ecosystem and pollution, not a problem on any level, on any scale. Cancer? No. Heart disease? No. You have a perceptual problem. And a lot of you know that the 12-step programs are so helpful at helping people escape their addictions. The 12-step program takes a very similar approach. You have to first get the one who's got the problem to recognize that they have a problem. And if they aren't willing to recognize they have a problem, they're in denial, and they'll simply go on defending against the problem. They can't even come to accept that they have a problem. And so the 12 steps take you into that same thing. That we are powerless over our life, over the, powerless over the world. You have to come to a sense of the powerlessness over your hero of the dream, over the, the figures in the dream. You have to be willing to, as the serenity prayer says, you know, you have to see what you can change, what you cannot change, and learn to lean on the wisdom that knows the difference between what you can change and what you can't change. I always say that the Course in Miracles is just an expanded version of the Serenity Prayer. If you can get the Serenity Prayer, you don't need a Course in Miracles. You've got, you've got everything right there with that one Serenity Prayer. It's just a systematic way to, to help you, especially if uh, the scribe of A Course in Miracles, Helen Shuckman, said, uh, at last, a pathway to God for intellectuals. <laughs> so that's why it's got 31 chapters that's why there's 365 lessons we've got an intellectual problem going on <laughs> a mind that is denying that it's hurting and trying to convince itself intellectually through concepts that everything is hunky-dory <laughs> so it's a sophisticated system for undoing that so to me that's why I travel around. That's why I love to come to do these gatherings because I'm having an experience that there are no problems and I'm very happy. That's why I've got a big smile on my face. I laugh a lot. I sing. I do bursts of singing at times. I like to go skipping along in nature and everywhere because this experience that there are no problems, that all the problems have already been solved, that spirit has solved them. And then, when we come together, we are joining our minds together to come to that experience together. So if someone believes they have a problem, believes they see a mistake, believes they see an error, then let's look at it together, honestly, and see if that's really true. I would say, honestly, that none of us have a problem right now. All problems are either remembered from the past or anticipated. They're either regrets of the coulda, woulda, shoulda. Things could have been different, and oh, my life would be so great if it's, this had only been different. It's all these regrets or worries and concerns about the future, which is really just the past projected onto the future, keeping us from the now. And so when we go much deeper into that, we come deeper into the presence, we come deeper into guidance, we come deeper into our intu intuition, and to an experience that there are no problems. It takes a lot of trust and faith to go for that because there's a part in your mind that's convinced there are problems. And our educational systems and all the, the gyrations that we go through are all based on this belief that there are problems in the world that we have to solve that deny the perceptual problem like looking through a cracked lens and not seeing clearly. I was in Australia this year and I was driving along, of course, you know, they have the steering wheels over on the, the right side, so I was in the passenger side on the left side of the car and I was driving along. Uh, Sam was in the car with me. I was in one of my discussions. You put me in the passenger side and I'm just, I'm telling a story, sharing something 
enlivening. I was talking about something, and then we drove by this guy who was one of the weed whackers, those gasoline-powered weed whackers, was whacking on the side of the road, and a stone came at the car at a very high rate of speed and smashed my window at, right in the middle of my parable. <laughs> and I, I paused for a moment and looked at it. It was going, it was shattering into, oh, so many pieces. You could hear all the way to the edge of the whole window. And so I, 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 I looked at it and then I continued on with my parable. Uh, because to me, that's what the separation is. It's just, it's just this thing that seems to be going on there, but I didn't give it really more than a second of attention. I just went, oh. then I went back to the parable. It, while it was still going, shh, I could hear it still shattering. Even when I got out of the car, it was still, you could just, it was still fragmenting. It was just breaking into tinier and tinier and tinier and tinier pieces. And I, I had to bring that into the parable. I said, look at this whole cosmos is just like that piece of glass. That reminded me so much of the cosmos, of the chaos, of the entropy, everything I've just talked about. It just kept splintering, splintering, tinier, tinier, tinier. Even after 10 minutes, I could still hear, it was still, it's still going, you know, it's still breaking into tinier and tinier pieces. Fascinating, but when you don't give your attention to it, when you come back to the heart of love, when you come back to, what am I here for? What is my purpose? to extend the love of my Creator, then you don't really have time or attention for all of that. That's just another distraction. I wasn't even curious how it happened. You know, we, we did look over. The guy who was doing the weed whacking had, had headphones on and he was just having the best time and totally unaware of any rocks or windows or anything. You know, he was not part of it in any way. He wasn't going to buy into this causation stuff. Because as soon as you started to get into causation and form, then you're getting into guilt. Who's to blame? Who's to pay? You know, it gets into all that. Jesus said something amazing 2,000 years ago. He said, the Father and I are one. Which I think is amazing because if you think of God as the creator or the, the prime cause and Christ as the effect or the perfect extension of that prime cause, the Father and I are one. It means in heaven that God and Christ are not two separate beings, that they're just one spirit of love. And this world is the belief that cause and effect are separate, somehow that the Son or the Christ could leave the Father, or leave the Creator, and have its own autonomous life. Life in form, life in, in te the temporary. And what I discovered as I look close at that is that everything we study in this world, every, I was in university for 10 years, undergrad and grad, every discipline that you study in this world, as different as they are, they all have one commonality, and that's the belief in causes and effects in this world. The belief that cause and effect are separate. The cause comes first and the effect comes second. And every perception in this world is a denial that cause and effect are together. That, that Christ is an idea in the mind of God and has not left its source. So this whole world is an attempt, an authority problem, a question of who is my author? Was I authored by time and space? Do I have parents and conception as my beginning? Or do I have a divine parent, a divine source? Though that's what we're deciding between every second of every day. Who's your daddy? All we have to do is solve that one riddle, who's your daddy? And then you're happy. <laughs> Imagine that. Every question, every struggle of the world, politics, environmental, I mean all the things that the mind just goes around and around and it's really a question of source. Who is my source? Is love my source? When we give in to that and we accept that, then 
everything changes. Absolutely everything. So, Salida has the microphone. That's what I love about these wonderful gatherings as we go into this deeply and then I open it up to anything. Topics, concerns, issues, what's practical. We have some practicality. Yes, it's a good question. For me, as I grew up and went through my experiences on planet Earth, I think those kind of questions definitely get our attention. I would say I, I was, there was a time in my life where I had a great concern about social justice. I was very much of an activist um, because I felt like there were these very important causes that needed my full attention and it ranged from everything from poverty to nuclear proliferation to the treatment of, of people in different cultures and so on and so forth. And those were some of the ones when we talk about heroes, you know, uh, you're just rattling off my heroes. Uh, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Mandela, the three that you mentioned were like, in my mind, they were, they were heroes. And in fact, I've, I've gone to India, and I've gone to South Africa, and I'm very well aware of, of listening to Martin Luther King's speeches, you know, the very famous one, I, I Have a Dream. And Martin Luther King was a minister. He was very much inspired by... Jesus. Uh, Gandhi was very inspired by Jesus uh, in different cultures. Tolstoy was very much inspired by Gandhi, as many people were, and so forth. Mandela. What I did was, when I admired someone, and I, they stood out to me as, as someone that I wanted to be like, that I I admired them so much that I wanted to find out more and more and more about them. Read books, watch movies, and so forth. I was so inspired. And I was very altruistic too. I felt like these people are helping bring good to the world. So what I did was I read Gandhi's autobiography. Because he was, everybody watched the movie and everything. And Gandhi in his autobiography said he was experimenting with the truth. that. Gandhi, many, many, many times in his life, was very tormented. And so I would read his autobiography, because Gandhi came from India, and there are saints like uh, Ramana Maharshi and uh, Yogananda, and, and on and on and on. So Gandhi was in the middle of a country where there were many saints, going back centuries and centuries, and non-dual teachings. And at one point, Gandhi was asked, uh, uh, are you a saint trying to become a politician? And Gandhi said, oh, no, no, no. I'm a politician trying to become a saint, was Gandhi's answer. So if you go and, you, and read Martin Luther King and so forth, you will realize that 
Martin Luther King, as much good as he was bringing and extending in his life, he was aspiring to be as Christ-like as he could. And Mandela was aspiring to a higher state of awareness, and so was Gandhi. So my heroes, I realized, were all struggling and aspiring. So I, was, I became more interested in what they're aspiring to. So with The Course in Miracles, what that did was, it was coming from the Master himself, and he was basically saying, he said, basically, David, you know, you're psychotic, you've had a total break from reality, meaning heaven uh, and nirvana. You've had an absolutely total break. You're totally psychotic, you're schizophrenic, your mind is split, you're listening to, you're serving two masters. When I said in the Bible, it's impossible to serve two masters. You cannot serve both love and fear. And you're schizophrenic. You're listening to multiple voices in your mind. You're hearing many multiple voices. Every day when you walk out on the street, you're hearing all these different voices. You're, you're schizophrenic. And you're hallucinating. You are absolutely hallucinating a world that doesn't have any existence whatsoever. It's a total figment of imagination and you're absolutely hallucinating. Now, what would you do if, if you had to deal with somebody who was psychotic, schizophrenic, and was hallucinating? Uh, they need some major help. And what I discovered was, as I, the more I started to read the Course, I thought, wow, this is describing my mind. Uh, I may have heroes, I may even think I know what social justice is, and I certainly did, because how else would I be an activist without having a, a strong thread of social justice moving inside my heart? There's a part in the Course, there's actually a subsection of one of the chapters where it's titled, The Justice of Heaven. And when you read that section in the Course, The Justice of Heaven, he will basically tell you that there is no justice in the fragmented world that you perceive, and there never will be. He's not saying you can hope to reach a goal of social justice at one point. He's saying you are going after a ghost, you are chasing a ghost, and that had a big impact on me. I one time watched this video called The Story of A Course in Miracles and it had Milton Friedman was in it, a speechwriter for the President of the United States, uh, William Whitson who was a, a former general, uh, Pentagon general who was working as, a, as like an ambassador for the United Nations to China. I got to watch people, with one lady worked with dolphins. What I loved about that story of A Course in Miracles, where I got to see a range of people throughout the human condition all trying to practice A Course in Miracles. And what really got me was when I heard a politician like William Whitson, who ended up marrying the publisher of the Course, Judy Scutch, say the most impactful line for him from A Course in Miracles, because he had spent his whole political life trying to make the world a better place, his whole political life fighting for social justice, he said the most powerful line for him was when Jesus said, seek not to change the world. Seek rather to change your mind about the world. That is what I mean by we have to come to an admission that we have a perceptual problem. If we're looking through a kaleidoscope of cracked perception and we're trying to get activated about certain things and certain people, then we have to realize we are still part of a cracked perception, a hallucination, and the reason why we're not happy is because we're still so bought into this ego belief system. Now another thing that helped me was this idea that Everything that involved social justice revolved underneath on the belief in victimization. Uh, and I started to work with the Course and I kept going through it every chapter and I'd go through the lessons and I'd go through it over and over and over. And what Jesus was saying in there, he says, beware of the temptation to perceive yourself unfairly treated. I thought, that's amazing. He's, 
he's calling this is like a, a temptation. So what I perceived as social injustice, as people taking advantage of other people, as people being mistreated all over the place, he was saying that's a temptation. And it's a temptation to look, continue to keep looking through that darkened glass, instead of turning within to the Holy Spirit for a unified perception of the world. So the, the hardest thing to swallow about A Course in Miracles seems to be this perceptual problem thing. Because the ego has already done a strong convincing job that you're human, your time and space, you're stuck in it, like a fly stuck on a flypaper, you're stuck in it, and there's all of this injustice around you everywhere you look. And it doesn't matter whether it's it's your, your mother giving you a frown, or it's uh, somebody being beaten in prison. It doesn't matter whether it's a tone of voice, when you're expecting a happy, loving tone of voice, and you hear a harsh, condemning tone, even just a tone of voice, it hurts. The only justice is the justice of forgiveness, which is what I was talking about earlier. All things work together for good. It's the highest state of mind there is to reach a state of perfect acceptance. And when you see something and your emotions well up, like that's just not right, which happens as we watch the news, as we watch movies, as we're interacting in our families, in our, in our work environments. That's just not right. What the Course is saying is, like, you're never upset for the reason you think. You're never upset with what you perceive is happening. You are upset by your interpretation of what you perceive is happening. And then, through his workbook, he's going to show us that everything that we perceive is an interpretation. And as long as we have egoic interpretations, we're going to be upset. So, for me, when I really decided to practice the Course, I would latch on to a series of lessons that just resonated in my heart. And people have asked me, what did you do when you faced all kinds of temptations, when you got upset, when you were disturbed, when you were angry, fearful, guilty, shameful, all those things, I would practice lessons five, six, seven, eight, almost like a cadence. He goes like, ah, here you go, what do you think about that? Five, six, seven, eight. I'm never upset for the reason I think. I'm upset because I see something that's not there. I see only the past. My mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. Talk about a reorientation. Whenever I would get upset about anything I saw on the news, what, in my family, with my partner, with my cat, with my three-legged cat, whenever I would get upset at my three-legged cat, tripod, I would still have to work it back to five, six, seven, eight. I'm never upset for the reason I think. And you see how practical that is. It's almost like Jesus is saying, here, I'm, you're having a tough time, I understand that, but I'm going to give you some real practical lessons to help lift your mind out of the, the judgment and the darkness that you feel. And he even has a section pretty late in the text where he calls, he calls it the rules for decision. I'm like, oh great, Jesus Christ has given me rules for decision? That's what I need. I need some Jesus Christ rules for decision because my decisions are, are hell. <laughs> I don't know if there's an eternal hell, but my life in this world is a hell and I need to learn much better decision-making capabilities. So he's got like seven rules for decision, and, and but you start off there with the first two. Just like the first two commandments, you know, he said, are the most important. The first two rules for decision is decide the kind of day that you want. Be as specific as you want. What kind of day do you want? emotionally, specifically, whatever. And, number two, 
say to yourself, if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day that will be given me. So if you stay in alignment with the kind of day you want, a happy day, joyful day, a peaceful day, a flowing day, and you make no decisions by yourself, meaning with the ego, then you'll receive exactly that kind of day. Promise. He says, I promise you. And then if you slip off and you forget <laughs> one and two, he has three, four, five, six, you know, he's going to call you back. But he does say it's much harder to come back when you're gone. We all know this. I see heads nodding. Yeah. When we start to have a bad day, oh, it's not easy to snap out of it. You know, it's like, it's like it spirals. We go down, 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 down. But he's given us specific instructions on how to purify our heart. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. He's given us specific instructions. And he even says about his workbook lessons, you may not believe these lessons. Some of them you may fight against. You may actively resist these lessons. It will not matter. Just do them. Wow. That's a lot of trust. <laughs> you may actively re resist the lessons. Don't, it doesn't matter. Just do them. And by doing them, your experiences will show you that they are true. So for me, that's what I took the course right there at face value. And I thought, if he's giving me instructions, and he's giving me a way out of this uneasy feeling, of this feeling of hurt that I feel, then I'm going to try him out. What else did I got to lose? You know, give it a try. In fact, it got to me, it was like, give my whole heart to it. I ended up going so into it that, you know, I've got people that are working with me now that are sprinkled around the world. One of my friends, she's so devoted to the Course and the practical application of the Course that she's had two levitating experiences. The body is levitating. And that, for her, is just a symbol of her freeing her mind. It's not like, you know, you can't pin your hopes on that. I mean, those, those are two experiences, but that's where it goes. There's been removal of symptoms from bodies. There's been a raising the dead experience. There's, there's amazing, miraculous experiences that are happening from devoting the mind to this teaching in a very deep and uncompromising way. All those things that are promised, all the promises in the Bible come true when you give yourself, your heart and your soul over to them. Everything good that has been promised from, from God throughout the centuries and throughout history comes true, comes into awareness as you follow it without exceptions. And so, when you're asking that question, I can totally relate to it because I can go back in the parable of David and look at that slice where the, that was the very question that bothered me the most. It bothered me, it drove me to be politically active, to change the world, to try to make the world a better place. And yet, through my lessons of working with the Course, you can start to realize that a healed perception is no small gift. And a still and quiet and tranquil mind is no small gift. Like Yogananda is a great example. Even when he told his apostles he was, he was exiting, and they, some of them gasped, you know, his body remained in a state of non-decay for weeks. What a beautiful witness of that state of mind that peaceful, tranquil state of mind that, that Yogananda represented. Now that got my attention. I'm, I was ready to go for that state of mind. In fact, I just watched the, the, the last half of that movie, Awake, you know, the, the story of Yogananda. Amazing, spectacular, and, and it, it's worth it, you know. He, Yogananda just didn't sit in a cave. He came over here in the 20s and Boy, did he pour his life, his heart and soul, into that, extending that message. That's uplifting for me. That's inspiring. He talked a lot about Jesus. He talked a lot about his guru and 
the inspiration of the life that he'd been given in this world. And I, I really feel that's for all of us. You know, we all are being called to step into that calling in whatever form it, it comes. It comes in many different forms. But to me, that's what I went through. I went through the very, very same struggles and questions. Yes. Yeah. We'll send a microphone just because they record this and your question could help somebody over in Bangladesh for all we know or something, you know. <laughs> Yeah, sure. That's great. I love it. I feel like I, I understand what you're saying, but yet being homebound, bedridden, unable to walk for almost two years, it's everybody I called was just not believing I had a problem and didn't come to my assistance. I may have died again because I already had a deficit. So I know what you're saying, but can you go beyond that now? Because we have, I feel that we are all called, we all have our own calling. Yes. To do what God wants us to do. Some people are called to do what you're doing. Like, you're only called to do what you're doing. I'm called to do what I'm doing. Everybody's got their calling. So I really believe that God speaks to us and tells us what to do, what to do it, what to say, what to think. Yes. And I agree with that. But if yeah. being called to help the people, like this, the human trafficking, the, the, all the, the children and the teenagers that are involved in sex trafficking, you know, the, it's just, it's, there's some horrific things going on. And I understand what you're saying too about injustice and um, being an activist and letting it upset you every day. You know, that wasn't my calling. My calling was, I found out, to pray for those people. That was what I could do. But thank God, I thank God for the people that came to my side and brought me food and helped oh, me. Yeah. And so I think yeah. everybody just needs to be aware of their calling and what God wants them to do. And also to know, is this something that that for me, no, I'm not a really good, great person at all because I'm an emergency and you have to go to hospital. That's just not my thing. But I can help you with other things, you know, and I think it's about knowing yourself, who you are, and how it's who you are, and what you're, you know, what's going to help you yeah. stay in your peaceful place. Anyway, I could go on forever. I just don't know if I'm making sense or not. But like I said, it's all, it's all coming out right now, so, and I don't know if you understand it or not, but could you just, Try to answer part of it. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's beautiful because what we're coming back to is this idea that that the world is a, a symbolic representation. You might say that the world is like a motion picture of your beliefs. And you know, to say I am not a body, I am free is one thing. But for most people will say there's a very strong body identification. So the spirit is so loving is that it works with us and reaches us in our consciousness with what we believe. So for example, with A Course in Miracles, it, a good example would be healing. For example, when someone goes to have surgery or they, they go in a hospital or they're bedridden or they're unable to move, you might say that symbolically the helpers that show up are the mind calling forth help in a way that it can receive the help. Uh, for some people, like let's say you were bedridden and, and you prayed, and for some people if, if Mother Mary showed up at the foot of your bed, you might be more scared than a horror movie. Like, <laughs> oh my God, you know. And so, friends coming and bringing food and caressing you and so on and so forth, that's something more that the mind could receive, you know. It's symbolic of the love of spirit, the love of God reaching you in a way. Now, there are stories of Jesus from, from 2,000 years ago, you know, where, you know, Jesus saying things like, it is by your faith that you are healed. 
because sometimes he would go back like to to Nazareth or whatever, and the Bible would say uh, there were no healings. Jesus went back to Nazareth, and there were no healings. Well, what's going on? There's healings in Bethesda. There's healings at all these other places, and not in Nazareth. Well, Nazareth is where Jesus seemed to be born and raised. You imagine people saying the Messiah is coming, and he's coming. He's here to save the planet. And then you come back to Nazareth, and you go. I know your mom, you carpenter, don't give me this messiah stuff. I know, I, I watched you as a little boy, I knew you as a little tyke. You know, you're not the messiah, I know you're Jesus and I know who you are. And there were no miracles. So you can see that there's another part in the Bible that says a prophet is never a prophet in his hometown. There's so much association with the past that it's like, that's too thick. And, and there just isn't the, the faith that comes that Jesus said. So I see that as very natural. You know, you, everybody follows their heart. Everybody calls forth help. And it comes in a way that they can understand. And just like in the parable of David, I, I don't deny anything that happened. You know, when I was an activist, when I was out standing for things, taking sides on issues. You know, when I was a vegetarian, I was a staunch vegetarian. I would sit down with people and I would talk their ear off of reasons why <laughs> not only I should be a vegetarian, but they should be a vegetarian too. Oh, I had all the reasons lined up and that's just where I was. And I think it also applies, I remember with my my biological father, he, at one point, he said to me, Dave, I just wasn't a very good father. And at that point, I just said, that's nonsense. You did the best that you could do based on what you believed. I did the best that I could do based on what I believed. And let's take each other off the hook about could have been a better son, could have been a better father. That's not helping us at all. Well, as soon as I said that to him, our relationship just took off. We were so happy, 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 happy. And, and even when he was in intensive care and had gone into a coma, my mother and my sister called me to, into the intensive care unit. As soon as I went in there to see him, even though he was in a coma, he came right out of that coma for me. Uh, he zimmed right out of the coma and we had a com beautiful conversation of love and gratitude and thank you for everything. I love you so dearly. And then he went back into the coma and, and I was off traveling, I think in Florida, sharing and shining and we just knew that that would be our last time to see each other, but there was so much love. So I do say that, that what we do comes from what we think and we're all in a process of, of having our thoughts purified through prayer and then the actions just are like our outpicturings of what our belief system is. For Jesus, he could say something like, arise, take up your bed and walk. And if there was faith, if there was the faith, then we would see an amazing sight of someone who, who couldn't walk, walking. The blind can see, you know, casting out demons, all kinds of things because Jesus was so certain of who he was. That's where his level of prayer was, was, was really connected with the source. But for all of us, we can only pray and we can only ask for what we believe in. We can't go beyond, that's what uh, the uh, oracle told um, Neo in the Matrix. You know, no one can go beyond what a, a problem that they can perceive. I'm sharing just from my experience that there's no problems, but I'm not trying to tell everybody what their experience is. Their experience is what it is. I'm just talking about a, a, a thought system and a, a way of clearing the mind and purifying the heart to reach higher and higher states of mind. And it's not definitely not telling people what they should do or not do, because we, we all have to come from our heart. We have to follow our callings. And it doesn't look the same for everyone. There's no kind of cookie cutter approach, you know. Of, I always tell people, don't do what I did. Let's think in a, in a thought system of love. Let's learn to think together in love and then do 
I think St. Augustine said that. Love and do what you will is what uh, St. Augustine said. I love that. Yes. Hi. Hi. Hi there. Thank you so much for everything you said. Um, it really resonated with me. I've been studying the course for a very long time. And I sometimes wonder, am I putting too much effort into it? Am I, is there something about it? And maybe I'm fooling myself too. Maybe I'm, I think I'm putting effort into it when I'm not. So the question is, is, is there, you know, and I know you can't, you know, maybe I need to go directly to God and ask this question, but, you know, how much is too much effort, and how do we, you know, when is there a sign that we are fooling ourselves about are we really tr still trying to ride two horses and think that we're, we're you know, focused more on one, the spirit rather than the ego? And is there something in, that can enhance this whole um, practice? Uh, the, the example that I'm thinking of happened right today. You know, I think I'm having a really good day and something throws me off the beam and I get upset and I'm thinking, I should be further along in this process than I am. You know? <laughs> and it's, um, so, do other practices enhance the course? Do other, I mean, I've read things like disappearance and, <clears throat> and we're reading the other voice now. And, you know, you can, you can separate the wheat from the chaff, but there's also, I feel like, this blind spot that I'm still unaware of, and I want to go deeper. And maybe I'm efforting too much, I don't know. Does, does yeah. Yeah. Sense. Yeah, I can address that. I can address that. There is a part in the Course in Miracles where Jesus comes right out and says, "When you find resistance high and dedication weak, you are not ready. Do not fight yourself." I think that's a fascinating line. The other thing that's interesting about that line is because I traveled all these countries and out cities and out to the rural areas, I hear tens of thousands of stories of people who are working with the Course, and there's like a common theme in these stories, that they'll say, well, I, I got it into my house, but I, I wasn't ready for it yet, and I used it as a plant stand, or I stuck it up on my bookshelf. I mean, I hear these stories over and over and over, and to me they're all readiness stories, because the Course is so direct. It's like having your whiskey straight up with not on the rocks, no ice that can melt in there and dilute the whiskey. It's like a straight shot of whiskey. And, and how many of us are ready for the straight shot? You know, there's a pretty high percentage of human beings that are not going to want to take a swig of this course. So, it's very important because I hear people gently talk about over the months, weeks, months, or years, how how these synchronicities come, and they'll usually come to a point where they either go off on another path or they'll come to a point where they just have this feeling in their heart like they're, they're ready. And it does fit in with the efforting question because uh, the ego can become very obsessive and it can, almost like spinning your car, car wheels in the mud, you just keep pushing the pedal down more and more and more and you're spinning and spinning and you've got this this sinking feeling like, like something's not right <laughs> as the tires keep spinning in the mud, you know. So what I try to do is tell people, well, for me it's quite direct and simple. It's like the spiritual journey, authentic spiritual journey is like 1% principle and 99% practice. The 1% principle is important because if you don't have that principle correct, you're just practicing the wrong principle. <laughs> And that's not good. You're going nowhere with that. So, 
what I've tried to do in my teachings, and I just put, I think there's like 1,700 YouTubes and lots of, tons of teachings on the internet that just go back many years. But what I've done through the teachings is try to use lots of, of examples, talk about the metaphysics, but I kind of constantly am using examples and metaphors, almost like, did you get it? Okay, here's, try this one. Here's another example. Did you get it? Okay, try this one. Because that's what Jesus did with me. He was like saying, did you get it? Not yet. Well, try this. Now? No. Here, try again. You know, it, it was like a gentle teacher that kept giving so many examples and so many metaphors and demonstrations that I couldn't possibly miss it. Eventually, he knew no, how, no matter how thick and confused I was, that I would get it. So, what I say is, when I work with people you know, online or through counseling or one-on-one, -on -one or people who live in community with me, we really zoom into the core, core teaching, because it's really the Course is like a symphony. It just keeps coming and symphonically pointing at the same principle and going round and round and round and different nuances and language and angles and Shakespearean blank verse and double negatives and I mean <laughs> anything you can to get through to you. And as soon as you get the essence of the, of the core principle of A Course in Miracles, which is really the essence of forgiveness, then it really comes down to not making exceptions. And that's what the workbook's about. But I think you should do the workbook with a sense of, of ease not with a sense of perfectionism, not with a sense of being obsessive, because this is where the efforting goes berserk. You know, like, you, it says seven practice periods and you, you miss one and you just beat yourself up all night. You can't hardly sleep because you only got six in and you missed one. No, Jesus is, is very, there's always another lesson. You know, it's almost like you just give what you can give, and you, you try your best to do what you can do with it, but you don't keep it on, like, there's a scorekeeper, like, keeping score. Because that's, that's more from, like, they call it, like, type A personality, and, the, you know, that striving and pushing that we thought was really good. It doesn't work very well in spiritual awakening when we, we're critical, when we, we hammer ourselves. I found more and more when I just relaxed, uh, when I just relaxed and really stepped into, okay, what is it that I can really give and offer, took some deep breaths and went with it, then things opened up so fast and I got softer and more gentle and more easy. And even Helen Shuckman, she one time said in an interview that she said she tried to lose this course. She would. She would write it down in shorthand and everything, but she would leave it in the taxi cab, you know, leave it sticking here, leave it there, and people were always coming up, like the friends that helped you when you were bedridden. There were people always bringing the course back. She said, I just couldn't lose this course. She, she couldn't let it go. It kept coming to her, coming to her. And I feel like that's the attitude we need to take, is that we can't mess it up. You absolutely can't mess this course up. Then you can take some deep breaths and relax and go, ah, okay, I'm going to have some fun with this. I'm going to make this into an adventure. I'm not going to constantly judge myself. Could I have done more? What did I miss? You know, are there other people that are really advancing in this and I'm just the dunce of the universe? You know, these are the kind of thoughts that the ego tries to hold us down with. And really, I think we should be very very light-hearted with this. Yes, we've got, a, wow, this whole row. We're just going down one, two, three, four. We, and I see you back there too. You're next. We're, we're shifting back. <laughs> okay. Uh, we quoted the Jesus Christ saying, uh, the Father and I are one. And then this was after you we were talking about cause and effect. And then you said cause and effect are together, not separate. And my uh, thinking at the time was that then there's no difference. And, and it's 
that if the Father is one, then Jesus is one, then there is nothing. But then you said, and I believe you were referring to something that's commonly said, not necessarily that we should quote you on this, but uh, something like, uh, before Jesus Christ, the word of God. Before Abraham was, I am, or that. Well, e either way. Yes, either way. Uh, but in God's realm, there's no time and space, so how can that be? Yeah. That's a little clearer than that. Yes. Yes, you, you could say with, with regard to time and space and, and history, before Abraham was, I am, before before Jesus Christ was, I am, before the apostles or all of history, I am, before the world seemed to be, the I am presence was there, before the worlds were formed. But you're, you're correct that when we get back to this cause and effect thing, what we're told in the Course is that Christ is a pure idea in the mind of God, and why is one a cause and one effect if they're all the same spirit? What's this cause-effect thing even has to do? And basically what you might say is God is eternal, but it's a prime creator. It's, in other words, the only thing we're told in the Course is that God created Christ as an extension. Everything I give, I give to you fully. I give you eternity, I give you all the power, glory. God gave Christ, not Jesus, that was a man, that just a symbol that was pointing back to that spirit. But God gave Christ everything in creation, and then Christ keeps extending too. Christ has creations, but it's all spiritual. But the one thing we're told is that God created Christ, and Christ did not create God. Now why is that even important? If, if everything's one in spirit, then you know, why is that important? Why would Jesus even mention that? He says the ego is the one, that's the fall from grace, is saying, why be number two when you can be number one? When you can usurp the prime creator, and why, why do you need somebody to be a prime creator, you know? Why, why not you create yourself instead of God creating you as an extension of love? And that's what the ego jumped on. Everything we experience in time and space is the authority problem of the ego's belief that, oh, I can create myself. And even when we look at teachings in the New Age, for example, if you pick up a New Age magazine, and the title on the first page of the New Age magazine says, Create Your Own Reality. You see how different that is from God is the creator of reality to create your own reality, because the ego runs with that one, and it's like, I can make myself any way I want to be. And it's tried. Throughout all of history, it keeps trying to invent a better self. Oh, I'll be male. No, let's go for female. I like, the, I like those masculine attributes. No, no, I'm going for the feminine attributes now. I like a little mix here. You know, it's, it's always trying to come up with an identity, and that's what all of time and space is, is a confused mind trying to experiment with its identity instead of just accepting its pure reality of eternity and spirit that, that is a creation of God. So that's why even the teachings of you can create your own reality, that fits very well with manifesting, but ultimately if you're going to wake up and go even beyond the manifesting to the power and glory of being in alignment with, with God, then that's the, step, the next step, that God is the creator of reality. Yeah, it's like egoic cloning. And whereas in heaven it's just pure creation of light and love just extending on forever and ever and ever, here we have procreation, you see, and, it's, and procreation is also part of the, the cloning process. It maintains that. A parallel, I would say, is, for example, when we talk about cause and effect, let's, let's bring it down back to to terms we can relate to. Does anybody ever heard of, of, of a psychologist named Abraham Maslow and Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Wasn't that brilliant? I remember studying that. First time I saw that, I said, that's brilliant. Lower order needs and you keep going higher and higher and then 
what's the top of the, the his pinnacle was self-actualization. I said, that's what the Greeks were saying, know thyself, self-actualize, know yourself as you actually are. That's what the Greeks, all these mystics and saints are saying the same thing. Well, what did he discover about those that were self-actualizing, except that one of their characteristics were that means and end were together. Like the artist whose painting is so in the joy of the painting, being painted through, that they weren't thinking of the future. When will I finish? How much money will this painting ring? You see how the ego is the, trying to, to get us back on the timeline. When you're in the joy of the moment, when you're playing, we'll say you're in athletics and you're in the zone. Zakaria loves to play basketball. And he, it's a spiritual practice. He's out there, like Michael Jordan, fade away, yes, nothing but net. When you're in the flow of the basketball, beyond the keeping score, beyond the winning and losing, beyond the specifics, you know, the zone, don't we call it the zone when, when there's an athlete ice skating in the Olympics or something, figures, wow, perfect 10 in the zone. That's a spiritual moment because there's no means and ends that are separate. You're not doing something to accomplish something in the future. The means and ends are together, and that's what really Mezzo is pointing at. That's why it's self-actualizing. When you are in that state of mind, you're not thinking about the timeline. Children, when children are playing, remember when we were kids and we were playing? We didn't care what, what time it was. We did, we, in fact, we would hear, hey, Johnny, it's time to eat. You know, that was like, what? You know, we're in the middle of full, full on play, <laughs> and then Johnny, it's time to eat. You know, it's like, what's that? <laughs> you know? You know, people have asked me that. They said, you know, you were in school for, you know, kindergarten, grade school, junior high, high school, and 10 years of university. Out of all your education, what was your favorite topic or your favorite course of study or, or thing like that? And I just, I, I say right away, recess. <laughs> and they look at me like, that's not, that's not an answer. You know, that's not an answer. And then they say, no, something that was structured. Structured. And I would say, well, they would take us out on these um, outings, you know, where you could, we would go out on some kind of outing. That, that wasn't in the classroom either. I enjoyed the outings better than sitting in the... But that's where this is going. It's the essence that means and end are together, and that's what the present moment is truly about. It's coming into that state where we're away from linear time. And even in science, there's a parallel. You know, uh, Isaac Newton basically is the father of science. I would say the father of linear science because he basically believed that the world could be measured. That's where we got the scientific method. Most of us grew up with the scientific method and all of science today is still mostly Newtonian. And now we have quantum for the last uh, seven, seven or eight decades. Quantum physics is around. Niels Bohr, Einstein, and so forth. Quantum physics completely transcends Newtonian. It's, it's basically saying there is no world apart from the perceiver. Uh, the observer and the observed are not separate. It's sounding like the, the poets, Rumi, the mystics, the saints. You know, quantum physics sounds a lot like that. That's how spectacular it is right now that I say people are waking up, that are coming back to source right through science, the very thing. But, but they're having to let go of the, all the Newtonian assumptions, because that's horizontal. And this vertical science, I'm calling it, uh, is to the point. You know, it's amazing. We have someone in the back that's been, had her hand up. So, uh, as I've been listening to you, something's been coming to mind that I just want to bounce off of. Uh, your, from your experience, and you, you're so much farther ahead on the path, okay? So, um, it says, let me recognize my problems so they can be solved, and then let me recognize my problems have been solved. And I've been dealing with um, the situation in my family with two, 
two younger siblings to do things, and I'm trying to solve their problems because I'm the eldest one. This is what you do. But what's come to me tonight is let me recognize my problems have been solved. Okay? So part of my problem is thinking that I can solve their problem. Okay? <laughs> And the radical acceptance piece is, you know, if they're exactly where they're supposed to be, and even though they think I'm blowing pink smoke up their ass when I say it's, you know, all things work together for good, I say, well, okay, if you don't recognize that your problems have been solved, I can't change that for you. You know, I can only recognize that my problems have been solved. I can't solve yours, and I can't make you recognize that yours have been solved. Any, any, not one iota of a holy instant before you're ready. Okay, so that's one, like, oh, aha moment. And the other is this whole idea of let me be vigilant only for God. So when I'm going through my day and saying, you know, show me where you would have me go, do to me what you would have me do, say to me what you would have me say, and to who, yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. Um, what happens is if I'm vigilant for that, if I really try to pay attention and stay in the holy instant, the days do go pretty well. Uh, but when I fall off the, the horse, and then I can remember, you know, choose again, begin again, it, it, gets, it gets a little bit easier. So I just want to thank you for that, that, that bit that you talked about, let me recognize my problems, Kevin, <laughs> so not yours, and I can't help you recognize when yours will be or won't be. So it, it was just a big light bulb flash in a, when I've been facing this practical thing as an elder sister, where I'm like, I'm spiritual, darn it! I'm praying for you like crazy! Why aren't you getting it? Well, because it's not going to get it until we get it. So thank you. <laughs> That's great. It's very, you know, I know around Boulder there's, there's a lot of people that are into Buddhism and, and there's quite a lot of Course in Miracles activity around here, but you know, Buddha said, empty your mind, go into the void, empty your mind of everything you think, you think, think you know. Jesus says the same thing, Lesson 189, simply do this, be still, lay aside all thoughts of what you are, what God is, hold on to nothing. You know, Buddha and Jesus are just singing a song, saying, oh, an empty, still mind is, oh, you'll see how spectacular this is. And basically, what I realized is that, that Jesus says salvation is escape from concepts. So even though when you work with the Course and you go for it and you seem to work with these concepts, it's going to tell you in that same lesson, 189, forget this world, forget this Course, and come with holy empty hands unto your God. My heart chords, when I'm first reading now, I'm going, oh gosh, here we go. Oh wow, am I in the tractor beam? Beam me up. You know, here we go. It's ascension time. Because I could feel it so strong, like that was the answer. It's these concepts, self-concepts that are made by the ego that we identify with. And in the end, we outgrow them all. Like a children outgrow little toys, you know, they don't blow a trumpet or make a big stand like, I'm not going to ride my tricycle anymore. Da -da -da -da. You know, they just leave it in the yard, you know. <laughs> it's like, uh, and we can do that with all these concepts we've had. Men and women and mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles and workers and worker bees and on and on and on. Even course students and metaphysicians and, you know, this religion, that religion. It's so fun to be empty of all these concepts because you're so spontaneous, you're so joyful, you're so in the moment. You are so clueless. You get to be damn clueless when you empty your mind, because there's nothing in there except love and light. You know, there's, it's just happiness. Being itself is really all it is. So, Jesus was basically saying, I'm calling you out of the world, and I saw that he was merely meaning, just empty your mind of these concepts and judgments. Now, what happens when you do that is you will be delightfully surprised at how wonderful everything is. Where you anticipated grief and a loss, where you anticipated you would be sacrificing something, you find a happy lightheartedness instead. I remember in the parable of David, you know, there was times where I was playing baseball, basketball, football, lots of sports, and 
going to World Series games and All-Star games and all these things. Sports, sports, sports. I came from a very sports family. And, and then I was very, very active in everything. And then it was just one day, it just dawned on me that exercise was just a concept. <laughs> and I was like, oh, gosh. Concept, another concept. So as soon as I saw that, I thought, okay, I'm not, I don't ever have to give my attention to that concept again. This was many years ago. And of course the ego's like, you better be careful, you're going to atrophy, your muscles are going to atrophy, you're going to shrivel up, and you're going to, you know, it's like none of that ever happened. It's just blowing smoke. It's just, I've just had a ball. I've been all over the world, and i just enjoyed my life fully and everything, but I never had a thought. And then it also comes down to the same thing with diet. Is it organic? Is it inorganic? Is it got, you know, this? Is it got that? In it? You know, I used to, just like I did when I was a social activist, I would read all the ingredients, you know. I thought, oh, I'm going to read all the ingredients and take me ten times longer to shop to read all the ingredients. And everything. I was going to make sure I was just putting good things into my body. It's just a concept. You know, what happened to me when I started going out was that I had a, a, a control issue on my identity of thinking who I was, knowing what was right, what was wrong and everything. And when I went out on the road for five years without any kind of visible means of support or whatever, I just was like a sannyasi going around the country, the one thing that Jesus said to me about, about eating was, it was, eat whatever served. Oh, wow. You know, you think you go through vegetarianism, microbiotics, and everything. eat whatever served, and you're out on the road and you're in different houses every other day or whatever. I mean, down in South America, I swear there's barnacles and antennas and some of the stuff he showed, you know. And they're like serving it up with love, you know. And I'm like, but all that was was give up judgment. That's what he was saying. I'm, this is the fast track of giving up your judgments. Join with your brothers and sisters. Feel the love. They're just offering you love. You know, don't push them away. Don't throw up walls. Don't constantly be trying to push people away and say, I won't eat that and I'm different from you. Keep, stop saying I'm different from you through your actions and your attitudes and your words and join and connect. And that was a pretty fast track too. I mean, you know, that really got me into just trusting in divine providence. But it also helps clear the mind of judgments and then basically the appetites go away and you start to see everything's just like props, like it's all one big theater. But you're not focusing all this mind energy into even trying to be a healthy body because you realize that health is inner peace. Health comes through the purification of your thoughts. That's a lesson part of a, a workbook lesson, I can be hurt by nothing but my thoughts. So then you have an impetus to really forgive, instead of trying to control the form, eat the right things, exercise the right way, it just goes on and on, you can become obsessive compulsive, trying to live a spiritual life in form, when really it's the inner work, do the inner work, keep handing it over to the spirit, show me, guide me, direct me, that's what speeds it up. So that's what I would say has made the major difference for me. It's been really trusting and following when I'm told to, like, like career. The Course came into my life when, in the parable of David when David was 27. And so that's the time for most people when you're on alert for climbing the career ladder. And so I would have all these talks with Jesus. He would say, trust in me. Are you willing to question the belief in career? I'm like, yeah, okay, but I'm, I'm 27, you know, it's, I'm not getting any younger, and I don't want to be flipping burgers at McDonald's. Uh, you know, uh, career is kind of an important uh, idea. He said, are you willing to question the career? Because it's so linear. And, and he was taking me to these abstract experiences that were mystical and beyond the linear. So I, I was, and I, he did give me a series of jobs that helped, they were very humbling and they really knocked the pride out of me in a, hurry, in a quick way. But I also learned to, to go out on the road and live 
on divine providence because I was always saying, you know, people were offering me things when I would travel and I'd say, oh, I can't. Oh, I can't. I can't accept that. I can't. Finally, Jesus was like, would you stop that? That's me helping you and you're just shutting down. I can't, I can't, I can't. Pride, pride, pride. Here's some money. Oh, I can't take that. You know, he said, you're not going to be able to learn my lessons if you don't open up to the symbols being provided for you in unconventional ways, beyond the ways. Sarah's giving me the signal. So I think we're down to our final question. And it's Zakaria from Topanga Canyon. He's come all the way from California. Keep it concise, because when I run around you, I can go down the rabbit hole. But um, the course came into my life uh, for Chris uh, earlier this year, like first week of January, and specifically you, and uh, nothing has ever taken over my consciousness like this. It's really become the foundation of my entire existence. Um, and there's been a grand unwinding process. Uh, my uh, career and my fiance are both uh, completely dissolved. <laughs> um, and they were very much in like, very much present all the way up until like February, March. So it's a big unwinding. And I'm feeling more and more this sense of um, just being taken. Like I'm here to be used. And um, through the children's organization that we have, that's why I'm here in Colorado, and the family through spirit to be in connection with you, um, the peaceful ninjas. The question I have is, I find myself, and by that I mean the, the voice in me that um, is still clinging um, to projecting a certain level of happiness into the future, specifically even with what's being guided through and finding myself not being fully present to enjoying the perfection of each moment. And um, yeah, I just feel like to really be a, a clear vessel for what wants to happen through me, that I have to be as present and in just harmony with each moment as compared to that angst of like, having to get somewhere with it, which I find being like a pretty consistent thought. So yeah, if we could just uh, kind of speak on that for a moment. Yeah, th that is addressing a, just a very deep core of the ego in the sense that the ego made up linear time to as a substitute for eternal reality. So it's got all of its investment in time. And Basically, the ego invented hell, and the ego is basically saying that 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 the past is is its friend. So it's always focusing on the past and always projecting to the future, and that's this busyness, you know, that is trying to maintain a, a body identity. It's it's terrified of stillness. It's terrified of the stillness that comes in meditation. Um, so. We learn from Jesus that, that time is actually neutral to the Holy Spirit. It doesn't have any positive or negative value. But the ego has to give it some kind of value to keep it in awareness. So it's very, always coming around with, you know, well, things are going to get better in the future, and they'll get better, and they'll get much better. You know, it's always trying to push it off into the future. And for most of us, that's something that we've realistically come to expect and accept as part of spirituality. Hope for a better future. I mean, who among us hasn't thought, I hope it gets better, I hope it will be a better future. You go through enough chapters of the Course and then you get back to the immediacy of salvation where Jesus says, be not content with future happiness, for it is not your just reward. Now he's really cranking it up. He's really zooming us into the kingdom of heaven. 
Remember 2,000 years ago, the kingdom of heaven is at hand? A hand is very close. He wasn't talking about prophecies and future times. He was zooming in, you know, you, you, the winds come from the south and they blow and it's hot air and you know that it will be hot and then the winds change and you'll know it will be this way. But, but who among you have considered the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is now. He's zooming us into a state of mind that is absolutely being present, which is what I hear. You, you feel the call, like you're just called into that. It takes enormous trust to go follow Jesus into that moment because, because the ego always is going to say that there's going to be practical outcomes and logistics that you're going to have to handle. And as long as it keeps projecting those out into the future from the past, it's, this, it's like a net. It's making a net to capture the mind. And the reason that we're called into our divine function or our purpose is because our purpose helps us feel like we're done through instead of that we're the individual doer. And we want that doer to dissolve because the ego made the doer. And when you're a doer, is it ever enough? Could I do more? You know, how much of us we think of with our roles, could I be a better mother, better father, better son, better daughter? Could I, could I do more? Could I be more productive? Could I be more effective? Could I have more effort? Could I give more effort? It's, it's always projected onto this doer. And what I found, the greatest thing about the guidance is when I tuned into it, it just effortlessly flowed through. Like this is like a puppet that the divine is using to loosen my mind from identifying with the puppet. So I, I kept going for the purpose, like show me how to forgive, use my skills, use my abilities, and the more we have a unified purpose, the more we come to let thine eye be single. We come to a unified experience of the world. Everything seems more simultaneous, and, and we lose track of that, that linear movement. That's, the ego is always counting the days, counting the hours, looking ahead, looking back. It's just... That's what it does. So, you know, you can tell by how you feel you have a great inspiration with the children, with working with the children. And you get such reflections back of that love and that playfulness and that spontaneity. You know, the children are like reminding you on a consistent basis. And it's, it's taken you out of a lucrative career of buying and selling precious metals to with the children now, you know. And Jesus said, except you become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, meaning being as God-dependent, as spirit-focused, as just like infants need their parents to survive. We need that to open to our spiritual being. So it's the purpose. When it's not so much ever a matter of time, but it's just in your heart going with that question, spirit what would you have me use time for? What purpose would I invest my time as if time's like a currency that you can spend anyway, but Spirit, you tell me what to do with the time. And for you and I, it seems to involve changing airplane flights because every time we come together and we talk, then you're you're off to India? Nope. Change of flight, or you were you were here in Boulder for these other events, and, and I we did a, a little Facebook chat, and I said, you're in Boulder? I'm coming to Boulder <laughs> tomorrow night. He goes, here comes the plane ticket. I've got to change my plane ticket again, which allowed for us to have this wonderful time together. <laughs> One more plane ticket change. <laughs> all in divine order. So thank you all so much. I think Sarah has a few things she wants to share, but I just am so grateful that we could have this wonderful experience here together. It's deep, but you know, it's down the rabbit hole. Let's just all dive down the rabbit hole together. You know, we can't be held back. There's nothing that can stop us from knowing who we are. And spirit and love is inevitable. And the ego doesn't like that word, inevitable. 
because it's a certainty of our identity. So thank you so much for coming tonight, and I'm so glad. And if you get a chance, uh, a few of us, I see Lynn here, we're going to be up in Estes Park having a blast uh, these next several days, all the way through Sunday. If you get a chance, you want to come up. I'm sure Cheryl can make, make room for that. <laughs> Good catch. <laughs> I just want to say thank you very much, David. That was really, really, really fantastic. And I, I could feel everyone just on, on everything you were saying. And I think a lot of what happens after a gathering like this, when the mind is really open and the heart is, is bursting with this experience that's been on offer and that we've all joined in, is, is what now? And I'd like to draw your attention <laughs> on my own to the mic. I'd like to draw your attention to just our table at the back because I have a couple of, of things for you. This little quantum forgiveness card has some of the most profound websites on the back. Many of them are free, and I really encourage you to pick one up and check it out when you're at home. And then our movie watcher's guide to enlightenment is another wonderful resource. And our mystery school, which is upcoming. So I just really encourage you to take a look at that table and pick up these cards because each one is really a gift for going deeper in the mind and really coming into this actual experience. You're not being invited into anything here that is not possible for you. And it's now. So this is a very real invitation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And if any of you are locals and you would like to come to Estes Park, Shell Kaplan is uh, arranging day passes for locals, so if anyone's interested, I can give you her phone number and you can connect with her. So, thank you very much. I know there's many of you who study A Course in Miracles and you're in different avenues, well, I encourage you to all connect here tonight uh, and get to know one another for, for perhaps going deep or perhaps you start doing movie nights as well, using fun to forgive us. So, thank you very much. We also have one person here who thought they had a lift to Estes Park tonight, Lynn. <laughs> She does not now. So is anyone feeling open for holy encounter? Just connect with Lynn to see what she'll do tonight to get us to talk tomorrow. So anyone's just feeling inspired, spirit will work through you as we break it through. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.